Hi, I'm Dr. Lin. I'm the scientific officer at Materials and Manufacturing Future Institute. In this video, I will be covering a brief theoretical background of the whole effect, some samples commonly used in whole effect measurements, how to set up experiment, and how you might use the result. Let's go into the lab. Imagine an electric circuit consisting of a power source connected to a metallic material via a switch. As the circuit is closed at the switch, electrons pass through the metal block, and we can attach a voltmeter on the circuit to identify the conductivity or resistivity of the material. The conductivity can be understood as a free electron gas passing through the metal and colliding with the metal atoms of the lattice. The current is consisted of a number of charge carriers, typically electrons, holes, and ions. Each carrier can travel with different velocity, while all carriers exert a net velocity. With these physical concepts in mind, let's introduce a magnetic field and observe how the carriers move through the solid, aka the Hall effect. The Hall effect was discovered by Edwin Hall in 1879. It is the production of voltage difference across an electrical conductor which is transverse to the electric current and to an applied magnetic field that is perpendicular to the current. As a carrier, for example an electron, travels through a conductor in the presence of a magnetic field and an electric field, the electron will experience a force known as the Lorentz force. The Lorentz force will push the electron to travel closer to one side of the conductor. This will create a charge separation in the transverse direction and as a result a voltage difference is created which is known as the Hall effect or Hall EMF. Consequently, due to the charge separation there is an electric force acting on the electron. When the magnetic field is equal and opposite to the electric force the motion of the electron is stabilized. You can also figure this out by using the right hand rule. Take your right hand and hold it out with your palm open. Your thumb is in the direction that the proton is moving, or the current. The rest of your fingers show the direction of the magnetic field. The resulting magnetic force on the proton comes out from your palm. We can also apply this rule to a piece of semiconductor. So, why is the whole effect useful? What can it do in real life? Well, as we just talked about, it describes the motion of the electron in the conductor, so it can be used to measure the strength and direction of the magnetic field, or to measure the number of carriers in the conductor or semiconductor. In our lab, we use the Hall effect to measure the carrier density and carrier mobility of a sample, such as semiconductors. There are naturally occurring semiconductive materials, mainly due to native defects like vacancies and lattice defects, and these materials are called intrinsic semiconductors. There are also so-called extrinsic semiconductors, which is a material that has had foreign atoms purposely added or doped in, causing the material to have excessive electrons or holes. Just to give you some definitions, semiconductors with more electrons are named N-type semiconductors, while those with more holes are named p-type. A handy hint to remember is n for negative and p for positive, as electrons are negatively charged and holes are positively charged. An example of an extrinsic semiconductor is the traditional n-type silicon semiconductor. By doping group 6 elements into silicon lattice, an excess electron is produced which can act as a free carrier as we apply an electric field to it. Extrinsic semiconductors have been used in a wide range of electronic devices and solar cells. Let's come back to our question. How can I identify p-type and n-type semiconductors? The answer is simple. We can use the Hall effect to differentiate. This is an n-type semiconductor, which is doped with an electron donor element. 
the n-type semiconductor is firstly connected with a current source. It creates an internal electric field and drives electrons to move. Later, a magnetic field is applied on semiconductor. Due to the Lorentz force, the movement of electrons is deflected. As the Lorentz force continues to deflect the movement of electrons, the electrons will accumulate to the edge of the surface. If we measure voltage between the top and bottom surface, a negative voltage can be obtained. For the p-type semiconductor, holes are the majority carriers, so a positive number can be read in the voltmeter. This is the physical property measurement system by Quantum Design at our UNSW facilities. It contains research dewars, superconducting magnetic system, temperature control systems and pump stations. The system provides a stable physical environment for Hall effect measurement. The control panel displays real-time temperature, magnetic field and other physical states of the chamber, allowing users to monitor key measurements in real time. Here is the chamber where samples are loaded. Other measurement options are also available, including BSM, vibrating sample magnetometer, Raman spectroscopy system, or heat capacity option. A typical semiconductor sample is mounted onto the PCB sample holder using wire bonding. Ensure each corner is securely positioned. This is the standard procedure of loading a sample for measurement. The sample holder is attached on the end of the probe and then inserted into the research viewer for measurement. After loading a sample, users can set up the sequence to input the measurement parameters and procedures based on the requirements. As the measurement begins, the PPMS will show real-time results. Users can also view the data at different scales. Raw data are saved automatically for further processing and analysis. So that's the whole effect in a nutshell. At MMFI, we have the most advanced research and production facility in the country with more helpful video like this one in the works. If you ever need to use our facility, get in touch with us today. Thanks for watching.